Members, the first item on the order paper is a motion on the local economy and post-Brexit preparedness. I will ask the clerk to read the motion. That this assembly notes with concern recent comments from the Northern Ireland Business Brexit Working Group regarding the lack of technical and operational details available to local businesses concerning the changes that will come into force post-Brexit recognises the very complex and unique characteristics of the local economy, is concerned by the precariousness of many of our small and medium enterprises at this time, and calls on the Minister for the Economy to establish urgently educational and training opportunities to enhance the capacity of local businesses to prepare for post-transition training arrangements. Thank you. And I call Kiva Archibald to move the motion. Moved. The, thank you, members. The, uh, the Business Committee has agreed to allow up to one hour and 30 minutes for this debate. The proposer of the motion will have 10 minutes to propose and 10 minutes to wind. One amendment has been selected and is published on the Marshall list. Please open the motion. Um, and the motion we are debating today was actually submitted in June following the NI Business Brexit Working Group paper on implementing the protocol. But the motion and its sentiments are as relevant today, and indeed more so given the revelations of the past two days, because very little has changed. The motion talks about the complex and unique characteristics of our local economy. We have an economy in which the vast majority of businesses are SMEs that has highly integrated supply chains across the island, with some products crossing the border numerous times in the production life cycle, and where more businesses trade north-south than anywhere else. It has been well documented over the course of the past four years how damaging a Brexit which does not take into account those unique circumstances would be. That is one of the reasons why the protocol in the withdrawal agreement was painstakingly negotiated. And let us not forget it was negotiated and it was a compromise on behalf of the EU27 as well as the British Government. The protocol is the legal basis for how trade will occur post-transition and businesses need to be supported in preparing for the post-transition trading arrangements under all scenarios of the future economic partnership. There is now 16 weeks until the end of the transition period, and the calls for technical details and for solutions that reflect the needs of businesses are still as relevant today as they were three months ago. We have heard from numerous representative bodies about the challenges facing businesses in terms of the timeframes to prepare and that it will be not possible to have systems in place for checks and other procedures. The British Government had the opportunity to request an extension, which given the unprecedented circumstances created by the coronavirus pandemic, would have been the responsible thing to do. But instead, they sailed through that deadline with little consideration of the impact on businesses here who are already reeling from the impact of COVID-19. Over the course of the past few months, it seems some realities have dawned on the British Government with the acceptance that goods entering the North will require customs declarations, and at the beginning of August there seems to have been an acknowledgement that they were unable to deliver on their conflicting promises of no additional burdens, and that the unavoidable avalanche of red tape was going to be costly. Unfortunately, there is no clarity around the permanency of the arrangements and funding of the Trader Support Service. Currently it's two years, and there are of course still questions around how the customs processes and the verification of those will work. Ultimately, however, it is the lack of progress in negotiations on a number of key issues, like how the complexity of dual VAT systems will work, what are the certification requirements for agri-food, and critically, what unfettered access will actually mean, and what is the definition of at-risk goods. These are issues which urgently need resolved, and instead of committing themselves to meaningful negotiation, we have the British government indulging in brinkmanship with mooted plans to abandon the withdrawal agreement and implementation of the protocol. We await the publication of the legislation to see the extent to which their reckless words turn into reckless actions. But let's also be clear, we are not the only ones awaiting that. Any country considering entering into trade negotiations with Britain will also be watching because this is about trust, that you can account on those you have made an agreement with to deliver on it. And whether the British government or the DUP or anyone else likes it or not, the protocol has been agreed to. It is part of an international treaty and it cannot be wished away. It is a necessary mechanism to protect the Good Friday Agreement, the All-Island Economy and North-South Cooperation. Go ahead. 
The member mentions the uh, importance of north-south trade, and of course I acknowledge that the Republic of Ireland is our largest foreign trading partner. Would the member also acknowledge that for businesses in Northern Ireland, the biggest element of our trade goes east-west to GB? And I thank the member for his um, intervention. And of course, unfettered access is something that, that we all want to see progress. But I think that if you're talking to the 80% of micro businesses and the 70% of small businesses for which the only export market is the South, that they would really want to see that protected. And business groups have been clear here. They want the protections of the protocol. So what was agreed to by the British government needs to be implemented. This is vital to protect our businesses and people's jobs and livelihoods. And that brings us back to today's motion and we're what we are calling on the economy minister to do. We need to hear how she and her department are supporting businesses prepare for post-trading arrangements under all scenarios, particularly in the midst of the ongoing and increasing economic crisis created by COVID-19. What training and educational opportunities are being put in place and what is the time frame on those Will there be funds available to businesses to help them enhance their capacity to be able to respond to the challenges they face? And what is she doing to help them identify opportunities on an all-Ireland basis? We are fast running out of time and businesses and others are crying out for clarity and the ability to prepare. We need to ensure they are supported in that as much as possible. And so I urge members to support the motion. Thank you. And I call on Matthew O'Toole to move the amendment. Uh, so moved. Uh, thank you. And uh, you will have 10 minutes to propose and five minutes to wind. All other speakers will have five minutes. Please open the debate on the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, rising to propose this amendment, I'm conscious of two things. First, our duty to represent the best interests uh, of our constituents and the best interests of the people of Northern Ireland as a whole. And second, the traumatic pandemic our society is still going through and the profound economic trauma that we know is likely to face us in the months ahead as we debated last night in this assembly. For these reasons, amongst many others, it is critical that we debate today the economic consequences of the breathtakingly irresponsible conduct of the UK government uh, in refusing to extend the transition period, uh, as this uh, assembly very reasonably requested in June. Um, it is worth, briefly, before I move on to the... Are you happy to give away, yeah? I appreciate the member for giving way. We discussed this at some length yesterday. The member be aware that the principle of dual consent is enshrined in the Belfast Agreement, which, like the laws of the Medes and the Persians, can't be changed. Does the member acknowledge that not a single Unionist member of this Assembly voted for the motion that he refers to? Uh, I thank the member for his intervention. He will be aware that um, dual consent didn't apply to that specific motion, and if he or any other member uh, across the House had decided to uh, invoke the, the, the principle of cross-community consent, they could have done so before the, the motion was debated, and they didn't. Um, uh, it is worth us pausing and reflecting quite how far the Brexiteer vision has shifted since the EU referendum in 2016. I remember them well. I was working as a civil servant making the case for the UK to remain in the EU. Back then, numerous leading camp Brexit campaigners said the UK would remain in the single market after leaving the EU. Absolutely nobody is talking about leaving the single market, said Daniel Hannan, prominent former Tory, Brexit, uh, former Tory MEP. Then, for years after the vote, it was claimed, including by some in this House, that leaving the single market and the customs union would be a doddle, with Boris Johnson going into last year's UK general election promising a fantastic deal, Super Canada plus plus, as he called it. Now, as we debate today, the latest round of negotiations are beginning in London between the UK and EU. Boris Johnson is saying that no deal, meaning the UK crashing out of its current deep economic relationship with the EU and having the same trading relationships with its near neighbours as Mauritania, would still be a very good outcome. We are, Mr Speaker, through the looking glass of economic lunacy, and no one should ever forget where responsibility lies for the disruption of Brexit and the consequences being visited on Northern Ireland. Our region has always been in the front line of the impact of Brexit, not just economically, but societally. Our unique society and the political institutions which have underpinned it since 1998 were placed in jeopardy by the UK's decision to leave not just the European Union, but to do so in the most harsh and complete way, removing the UK not just from the political ambit of the EU, but virtually all of the economic linkages too. Those who complain about the protections in the Ireland Protocol, and I understand and respect that there are many who, uh, um, people who have issues with it, including in this House, should reflect on why those protections are necessary in the first place, and also be honest with themselves and others about what would happen if those protections were not in place. 
It is essential that the protocol is implemented in full and, yes, implemented in a way that allows businesses maximum access to both uh, the UK market and also EU markets. We have always maintained that there should be as few barriers to trade as possible across these islands, indeed across the continent. But I will not listen to complaints uh, in detail about the provisions of the Ireland Protocol from some people who made it necessary in the first place. Moving on to the specifics of the motion, it is essential that these institutions, both the Assembly and the Executive, do everything we can to cushion the impact of Brexit on an economy that will still be reeling from the impact of COVID-19. And here, I hope uh, today we can find some unanimity of purpose. It is clear, as I've said previously while debating uh, Brexit in this House, that there are people who take sincerely different views on Brexit and people who take sincerely different views, of course, of the protocol. But there are many things we can do together as an assembly and an executive to give clarity to the businesses and workers who are crying out for it. As I said, it's essential that these institutions, both the assembly and the executive, do everything we can to cushion the impact of Brexit. But this is just a private member's motion with respect to the member who's just moved it. Uh, as, and, and my amendment is just an amendment to a private member's motion. It isn't legislation and it isn't direct action from the executive. Since the institutions restarted, I and my party have been shouting about the lack of detail from uh, the executive about Brexit preparation. Now, I accept, and I have had much correspondence with the minister about this, that this in large part is as a result of lack of detail that has come from London. But it isn't enough for us collectively to simply defer to London and say it's for the UK government or we're really going to HMRC or the Cabinet Office or, heaven forbid, number 10 for more information. I certainly I don't work there anymore, as the member will recognise. Um, uh, we have had a very uh, non-detailed command paper, which came out in May. We haven't had any further details since then, other than the announcement of a trusted trader scheme. But very little detail about how um, the border uh, operating model will work. Our businesses and society, and our society, know the limitations of our devolved powers, and most of them are all too aware of the ideological obsessions driving the current UK government. But they do expect our executive to take a public stand in speaking up for them and the people they employ. But this year, the silence has been deafening. From the Economy Department, with respect, but also from the Executive Office, which has formal oversight over Brexit policy. And I've written to the Joint First Ministers on this numerous times. Mr Speaker, the Executive could not even speak with one voice to insist on an extension to the Brexit transition period, despite it being in the overwhelming and obvious interests of not just people in Northern Ireland, but actually people across the UK. We, knew, we, knew, we now need to see the Executive, including the Economy Department, ramp up communications to businesses on preparations for the end of the transition, but also to speak directly and bluntly to the UK Government about its handling of Brexit. And let me say here, speak to other parties too. Speak via the North South Ministerial Council to the Irish Government. Speak to the European Commission in Brussels. Those aren't illegitimate things for the executive to do in order to get the best possible outcome for people and businesses here. Mr Speaker, if Wales and Scotland can do it, why can't we? So our amendment today focuses specifically on legislation and, and as I said, we endorse the meat of the main um, motion. We know that this chamber will have to pass a significant volume of legislation, both primary and secondary, by the end of this year. But as yet, we have had no formal update from the Executive Office. I have written multiple times asking for that this Assembly be given clarity on the, uh, be given information on the work we will be uh, expected to undertake this autumn. We have not had it yet. Just as we have not had a clear economic recovery strategy from the, eco uh, from the Economy Department, and again, I, I appreciate there have been... Yes, happy to give away. Yeah. I am listening with interest. Um, the member says we need legislation to iron out some of the difficulties. But yesterday, he was the very member who brought to this House his outrage at the fact that the sovereign government was prepared to bring in legislation that would ameliorate, for example, the exit declarations. Why is he so, if he's concerned about the difficulties being created, why is he so opposed to a government ameliorating the exit declarations, or does he agree with exit declarations? Um, my outrage yesterday was specifically in relation to uh, the sovereign government, as he calls it, um, uh, obviating, walking away from repudiating an international treaty he has, he has signed. And as someone who clearly uh, very much believes in that sovereign government and Northern Ireland's membership, 
of its state. He should reflect on, the, on, on what it would mean for that sovereign government to walk away from a treaty in terms of its, ability, its reputation internationally and its ability to sign further trade agreements. Um, so, as I say, we haven't had uh, an update on legislation which we need, nor have we had a clear uh, economic recovery strategy which factors in um, both the effects of Brexit but also the opportunities of uh, EU market access that we will continue to have, unlike other parts of the UK. Mr Speaker, just yesterday you rightly pointed out that you had communicated to the uh, Executive Office and I think the Executive more broadly that they should not be using accelerated passage to pass laws in this place except in extreme circumstances. Let's remember that when exec if Executive Ministers bring forward primary legislation in the coming weeks in relation to Brexit, it should not be rushed through this chamber, it should not be rushed through by accelerated passage given the importance of, ex of scrutinising it carefully and the consequences for the people we represent. So I commend this motion uh, and our party's amendment to it, but as I said, they are just private members' motions with little practical or legal effect, in fact, no legal effect. We need urgent action from the Executive, indeed from the Economy Minister, on preparing businesses and giving the public clarity on what is being done to manage this process, this process which, as I said, is being inflicted on us, um, including an update, an urgent update on what legislation this Assembly will be asked to pass before the end of this year. After all, Mr Speaker, why else are we here? Okay, thank you. And I call Gary Middleton and just to say that you have five minutes to speak, up to five minutes. Thank you, thank you. Mr Speaker, and I welcome the opportunity to speak on this motion. Um, despite the sequencing of this debate, I think it is fair to say that we do share the general aim, which is to seek greater clarity on the final arrangements that businesses in Northern Ireland will have to grapple with once the implementation period ends. There is no doubt that there is a greater need for urgent clarity on the nature of new trading arrangements, but the priority should always be getting the right deal for Northern Ireland. Uh, I listened this morning to some businesses who were on the radio speaking from uh, the border areas. Uh, they were very clear uh, in terms of their priority and ensuring that there should be no uh, border down the Irish Sea and that the, U the UK internal market should first and foremost be the priority. And you can see why that's the case, why it might be lost on some members in this chamber. It is important to note, as my, my colleague uh, Mr Salford had raised, GB accounts for 52.7% of Northern Ireland's external sales. Northern Ireland food and drink sales to GB valued at over 2.3 billion. 65% of Northern Ireland's purchases from GB were worth 13.3 billion. So you can see why protecting the UK internal market should first and foremost be our priority. I will indeed. Got there before you. Um, I appreciate uh, the member for giving way. In his uh, remarks introducing the amendment, Mr O'Toole referred to ideological obsessions. Now, I would never accuse Mr O'Toole of being a Euro fanatic ideological obsessive. I would never accuse him of, of that. But would the member agree that uh, it would be indeed the manifestation of ideological obsessiveness? Indeed, it would be cutting off your nose to spite your face, to cut businesses from Northern Ireland off from their biggest market out of an act of fidelity to Brussels? Member has an extra minute. Well, I, I would absolutely agree with that point, and I would urge members, whilst they may claim to be listening to businesses, to actually go out and speak to those businesses, speak to the lobby groups, absolutely, but speak directly to the businesses, as we have been doing. You will see that there is real concern about some of the proposals that have been made. It is also important to note, just in, in reference to the motion, that responsibility provide, to provide this clarity does not ultimately rest with the Department for the Economy, but it does rest with the UK Government who are negotiating on behalf of us all here in the United Kingdom. Getting the right deal should be the priority, but communication, if we're to be honest, with businesses has been poor and lessons must be learned going forward. That said, many of the parties currently berating the current risk to local businesses from a lack of clarity are the very people who jumped over backwards to promote the benefit of the protocol in the first place. While some have blatantly realised the dangers of trade barriers between Northern Ireland and GB and vice versa, the DUP has been consistent in our opposition to that. Could the member give way? Go ahead. Uh, thank you very much indeed. But of course, many of us will remember the events, I think, on the 3rd of October of 2019, when a certain political party, the DUP and its leadership, was embracing the idea of a regulatory border down the RSC. Can we, see, 
Can you explain how you've had this change of heart? And indeed, how you have this change of heart apparently within your party at this very moment in time? I, I thank the member for uh, giving me the opportunity just to address that very point. Because the facts are that the only proposal that we actually agreed to was actually a safeguard mechanism for Northern Ireland here in the Northern Ireland Assembly, which would have given us the final say on whether or not Northern Ireland would have any regulatory difference with the rest of the United Kingdom. And just, just to, I, want to, I want to move on because bear in mind of just a few minutes left. There are, in, in, my, in our opinion, the motion does wrongly focus on education and training opportunities for local businesses as we prepare for the end of the implementation period. Whilst, yes, there's room for this, in reality, there are a plethora of other substantive concerns that need to be addressed holistically by the UK government if Northern Ireland's unique and characteristic economic interests are to be protected moving forward. These include the absence of a timetable for legislating for unfettered access between Northern Ireland and GB, as outlined in the New Decade New Approach, the reluctance of some UK ministers to incorporate safeguards and standards relating to food imports within the Agriculture Bill, the impact of closing existing routes to lower skilled labour for key industries in Northern Ireland, such as the agri-food, manufacturing and hospitality. And of course, and importantly, the impact of alignment with the EU rather than UK state aid and farm support levels on inward investment and competitiveness in Northern Ireland. So to place all eggs in one basket and force the economy minister to simply focus on ploughing money into training for local businesses without knowing the eventual outcome of the talks would actually be very much counterproductive. Instead of reverting to a blame game, we need to look at these challenges in a rounded fashion in order to protect local interests. We note the speculation that the government will pursue fallback measures under the Internal Market Bill to protect Northern Ireland's interests should a deal not be agreed that mitigates the threat of the Northern Ireland Protocol. We will caref carefully look at these and the finer details and the clauses relating to this and we'll study them carefully. So, in terms of the motion, we will, uh, because we support the general aim of it, we will support the motion uh, and we will be supporting the amendment as well. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, and I call Steve Egan. Indeed, Mr. Speaker, and the Ulster Unionist Party will indeed be supporting the motion and be supporting the amendment as well. Uh, members of the Assembly will be very aware of the discussions that have been ongoing, particularly about the Northern Ireland Protocol and the much vaunted press release that there was out yesterday and the potential impact that has on Northern Ireland businesses and consumers. And there's an expression that I think that we need to be aware of, and this is the idea of a level playing field. And there is much discussion across Europe about whether the United Kingdom will be working on a level playing field with the rest of the EU. But I think it's fundamentally important for the people of Northern Ireland to know that they are having a level play playing field with the rest of their country. Because, as has been said many times, our largest trading partner is with the rest of our nation. And it's not just a matter of us sending goods to GB or GB sending goods to us, but it's also equally important about making sure when we come to issues around state aid that Northern Ireland is not disadvantaged. And we will hear many times over the forthcoming weeks as we hit the problems with COVID and the implications of trying to get business and manufacturing back together again, what we need to do for our aerospace sector, which will need state aid, what we will need to do for our life sciences sector, which will need state aid, and what we will need for our agribusiness and even things like fintech. These are areas that need to be sorted out. And one of the things, and I do hope indeed that uh, Lord Frost and Michel Barnier are listening to some of the elements of this debate today, is that we do need to see a level playing field across the United Kingdom to make sure that we are able to deal with both the problems of COVID and what happens after the 1st of January next year. If we look specifically at some of the other issues we have, and it's quite clear that we haven't seen any information on the trader support system. Uh, certainly. I appreciate uh, the member giving way, and members are being very generous. I'm down like a jack-in-the-box, but... I think there is a point to be made here. Does the member agree there is an irony that parties which either classify themselves as social democratic or left are to be found opposing the UK government having the opportunity for making state interventions into businesses that need help coming out of the COVID-19 crisis? 
Indeed, and I think if one looks at the history of sort of the social democratic movement and the labour movement that has been there as well, there has always been an implication of providing state aid and making state aid available on occasions where we wish to do that. Certainly. I think it's, uh, it's important that we understand that state aid needs to be reformed in the EU of that, there's no doubt. But what's going to happen with the state aid, would the member not agree uh, that it's being proposed by the British government, is that you know, you're going to have global corporations going to a member state, like Britain, who is going to give tax breaks and grants to those and the public money to those and that's the problem with what is being proposed here. There's no doubt the state aid needs reformed but we can't have a, state, a, a situation, I would ask the member, that global corporations go to the likes of Britain so that they get tax reform, tax breaks, grants and public money, that's where it goes, not to hospitals, not to doctors, not to nurses and not to schools. I just very much indeed the member, member for that. I want, and I, I want to remind the member you have an extra minute. Oh, thank you very much indeed. And I must admit, I find it quite ironic that a member from the party opposite, who talks about wanting an all-island approach, uh, points out the fact that one of the main reasons like the likes of Microsoft and Apple go to the Irish Republic is particularly for their tax breaks and their ability to work out the tax system. And it would be excellent if they ever paid 12% corporation tax, but most of the monies pay about 0.12% of corporation tax. So I think that argument is probably uh, sort of not even mute. I don't even think it's, uh, we should take it much further than that. But there are real issues. I talked about the trader support system. I talked about issues about trying to find out about what's happening in VAT and the implications of VAT when we come through. But we have heard many times about the implications that this is likely to have on the Belfast Agreement. The Belfast Agreement is about the principle of consent. And having read the Belfast Agreement more times than uh, many people indeed have, I cannot see anywhere in it that says anything about a border down the middle of the Irish Sea. I cannot see anything that says we're going to be in a position where the EU, or indeed a special committee to a joint committee, is going to set the laws here that we are in Northern Ireland. And indeed, yesterday, the Minister produced a document that was out for consultation about the energy market in Northern Ireland, about electricity. And within it, it says even though there will be reforms within the United Kingdom's energy market, those will not apply to Northern Ireland, and we shouldn't even consider it because we're going to follow the rules from the EU without any say. And I cannot see any members of this Assembly willingly to go for that and that process of non-democratic accountability. Because that is something we need to be able to address and be looked at. And just to wind up, and as I say, Minister, we need a plan. We knew this was coming. And the executive needs to gather together to do that. For those of us who tortuously sat through the new decade, new approach discussions, one of the few things we all agreed on is we needed a plan for Brexit and what we were going to do. We are well beyond the time, and somebody needs to take leadership. And much the way within health, the only person who's willing to take any leadership for health is our health minister. You, economy minister, now have the opportunity to take some leadership on this process. And we would ask you, with a degree of urgency, to take some leadership on this issue. Thank you very much today, Mr Speaker. Thank you. And I call Stuart Dixon. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I rise to support the motion and the proposed amendment today and indeed welcome the opportunity to speak on this important matter for Northern Ireland. You know, in 2016, it was notable just how little Northern Ireland was mentioned in the EU referendum campaign. In 2017, Liam Fox, the then International Trade Secretary, said that a free trade deal with the EU would be one of the easiest in human history. But not surprising to most of us here, Brexit process became stranded on the rocks of reality, on the border issue, and it necessitated an agreement. The protocol is an imperfect response to Brexit. It's a bare bones means to protect the institu institutions which maintain our economic, political, and social lives. It therefore has merit. Businesses sighed a small sigh of relief after a tempestuous series of negotiations in 2019. Unfortunately, here we are now, less than three months into the end of the transition period, and I really am quite exasperated and concerned that we have nothing but confusion and uncertainty at the very centre of our economic future. Indeed, a minister 
clearly only interested in following what London is doing and not particularly keen on taking any local initiatives herself. I'm truly concerned that the UK government uh, seems to want to use Northern Ireland once again as a bargaining chip, an excuse to destroy any hopes of a, as an excuse to destroy any hopes of a post-Brexit trade deal with the EU. I recognise that a lot of this has been press speculation in the last few days. Unfortunately, we have a government that does not inspire confidence. I, and I know many others, do not wish to gamble our future and the future of our economy. I'm sure there are many workers and businesses right across Northern Ireland would agree with that. Yes. Just reflecting on what the member said, he may be interested to note that in the last half an hour it's been revealed that the head of the, UK, the government's UK the government legal service, the head lawyer for the UK government, has resigned apparently in frustration at the UK government's approach to uh, the laws around implementation of Brexit. Presumably that would add to his concerns about the UK government's approach. It leads once more to the door of number 10 and to the Cummings faction inside that building. The, the concern expressed by the working group Indeed, I want just to take a moment to say a working group that does not minister have all voices in Northern Ireland in it, and I find that disappointing, particularly the failure to have a trade union voice in that working group. But nevertheless, uh, they uh, mirror what the business community has been saying, and they recognise that we have been left in the lurch. We're unsure what to do, knowing that this issue is complex and technical, and is yet another burden on business. The past few months have been turbulent and difficult for local businesses, particularly small and medium-sized enterprises. They have faced the additional challenge with COVID-19, restrictions, safety measures, supply issues and staffing. This requires additional costs and bureaucracy, which is necessary. What is not necessary is another huge dis disruption, a fog that hangs over the future arrangements of post-Brexit for business. Businesses want to prepare put themselves on the best footing for the future, but without training opportunities and a clear direction for the future, how are they supposed to confidently commit to investment and to take on new employees? It is time for the Minister to give us some concrete answers. Today on post-practice preparedness, we need to start to clear this fog. I think it is where the proposed amendment really adds to the motion. With an estimate of 100,000 people being out of work in Northern Ireland by the end of this year. The Minister's number one priority must be to defend jobs and livelihoods. A considerable amount of legislation needs to be passed, and while the clock is ticking down to January, the Department of the Economy is the lead department on this matter. We need a cross-executive uh, approach to this, a joint approach to giving business clarity, making Northern Ireland's voice heard in London and protecting our local economy from the adverse impacts of Brexit. Mr Speaker, we are now told no deal is a good outcome. I just wonder what a bad outcome would look like. The reality is no such thing as a good Brexit. Protocol is not perfect, but its function as a basic framework to protect Northern Ireland from some of the worst effects of Brexit. Thank you. I thank you and I call Gordon Dunn. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Uh, Speaker. This is indeed a very challenging time for our local economy, and there is no doubt that the fresh challenges which COVID-19 have brought about has only added to the need for clarity and certainty going forward for our local businesses in the future. The global pandemic that we are still contending with will change how local businesses operate in the future. Negating the threat of the NI protocol must be a central element to the economic recovery as we seek to rebuild, regenerate and build confidence within our local economy. We do share the general aims of this debate today and that we all agree that we need to seek clarity on the final arrangements which our local businesses will have to manage once the implementation period ends. The focus should be on getting the right deal Whilst uncertainty is difficult for everyone, the barriers created by the protocol could be even more damaging long term, and they have the potential to cripple and restrict many businesses. That is why the government must urgently address the uncertainty around our future trading relationships. In Northern Ireland, we are fortunate to have so many entrepreneurs, small and medium-sized enterprises, and the fact is that Great Britain is our largest and principal market. 
with, with it accounting for over 52% of the Northern Ireland external sales and 65% of Northern Ireland purchases. They are from Great Britain. Over 90% of local businesses here trading with Great Britain and SMEs and our food and drink sales to GB alone are valued at over £2.3 billion. All of this highlights the need for free and unfettered access to Great Britain. And that is why the DUP voted against the withdrawal agreement in Parliament. That is why the DUP has consistently opposed at every opportunity, whether that, that be in London, Brussels or Belfast, any concept that our economic place within our United Kingdom should be compromised by the protocol. The recent speculation that the government are looking at ways under the Internal Market Bill to protect our interests and mitigate the threat of the protocol are to be broadly welcomed. It is ironic that those who are so opposed to potential trade barriers and borders are the first to, to criticise any attempts to reduce the burden on our businesses and by exploring ways of breaking down potential barriers. Our focus remains on minimising the friction of the friction of trade in every way possible. Anything else will be harmful to business, cost consumers and reduce choice, and we must continue to work with Her Majesty's Government to remove any disadvantages to Northern Ireland brought about by the signing up of the protocol. Our local economy and businesses who make it, who make it have faced an incredibly difficult and challenging six months. We must protect local interest and there will be challenges ahead for businesses adapting to the transitional period and the post-Brexit arrangements. I do welcome the range of online tutorials and Brexit preparation grants and information workshops being delivered through InvestNI and indeed the value programmes, the valuable programmes through Intertrade Ireland. It is important that this work continues between the economy department, business organisations, local councils and our government, and I know the Minister will make this a real priority within her department and in ensuring interventions to help prepare businesses for new arrangements. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you, and I call Dagla Megalier. Um, again, uh, today's motion, I uh, believe, is, is very timely. And now, I want to reflect on this in the context of uh, the agriculture um, sector here in the north. Um, again, we know from previous discussions and debates here, many time that uh, Brexit has caused huge issues for our 25,000 uh, frontline farm families, and uh, you know the and for the wider food and drinks trade, which in the north accounts for, accounted for 4.5 million in turnover last year. Uh, the sector here is already under pressure with the COVID crisis and many other challenges, uh, climate uh, also being one of them. And of course, um, agriculture is a big exporter. We export 87% uh, of our agri, agri food produce uh, that's produced here in the north. And uh, yes, Britain is, is, is one of the uh, biggest uh, areas we export to. Um, it also goes to the south and also goes to Europe as well. So we need unfettered access uh, east, west, and uh, north, south, and uh, across the EU. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the member would also like to acknowledge the fact that the, one of the biggest agricultural markets for agricultural goods from the Irish Republic is the United Kingdom market. And indeed, anything that's going to be put in that's going to create an Irish sea border is going to, in fact, impinge on them significantly. And that is really going to affect small farmers and medium sized farmers throughout the island of Ireland. Member has an extra minute. Yeah, the member's right. You know, any, any barriers at all, any friction at all will affect not just the north of Ireland, but indeed uh, the island of Ireland, because Britain is, is a big market for uh, produce right across uh, the island of Ireland. And, um, yeah. <laughs> if the member is concerned about the fettering of trade, why then is he a supporter of the vehicle of fettering that trade? namely the protocol. It is the protocol that fetters the trade each way. And yet, he and his party are the biggest cheerleaders for that uh, uh, protocol. Well, I have to say that 
our party is one of the most vocal um, opponents of Brexit. It's something that we are completely against. This is not something we would want. Uh, the protocol is a way of grappling with a very, very bad situation. So it is, and we're trying to do our best, like all of the parties here, to make it uh, as seamless and as as frictionless as possible for the, the businesses and indeed their farmers and communities across the north here. And as I said earlier, the, the Brexit uh, will, has a disproportionate impact uh, on here when it comes to um, the, uh, certainly our agri-food uh, producers. The, uh, in the north, our, our, like our disposable income is lower than in Britain, and we heard from the Brexit group last week that the disposable income here in the north uh, is £119. And, in Britain, it's 215. So, any friction that's caused, any any um, uh, extra cost that's passed on, will have a disproportionate impact on consumers here uh, instead of across the water. And we also learned through the committee a number of months back that there's 200 lorries a day comes across the water uh, to here uh, you know, that stocks our cells. And the, the shelf life here is 12 to 18 hours shorter uh, than it is uh, across the water. So this is a, this, what we're looking at here is posing a huge impact to the entire food ecosystem here in the north. And there are many unanswered questions. And indeed, uh, a figure was put in that when, we, when the, DERA committee, the ERA committee met the the Brexit group last week. The Brexit group posed 67 questions, and so far 60 have not been answered. Things like what constitutes a qualifying good, what's unfettered access, two VAT regimes, tariffs, SPS checks, and of course the issue of labelling. Uh, it takes four to five months uh, to create uh, a new label, and we will ha have to create a new label here in the north for, uh, for our produce, and, uh, and it takes four to five months, so that deadline has already elapsed. Um, as I said earlier, Britain, yes, of course, is a big market, but we must also realise that the British market will shift as well. You know, as, as Britain cuts itself off from its uh, nearest uh, market, which is the EU, uh, as a result of Brexit, then they're going to be cut off from their biggest market, and that will imp an impact on Britain as an export market for us. And of course, if Britain then ex enters into trade deals with the USA and imports cheap food, then it suddenly the, the, the floor could drop out of the British market for, our, for the agri-food produce. So Britain won't be the same market post-Brexit that it has been up until this date. And I think that's something that we, we must realise. Um, again, and the latest shenanigans in London is causing more concern as well. And you know, our, our All Ireland trade, and I know some people like to emphasise that the British market is so important, but our All Ireland trade is hugely important within the agri-food sector. It's around uh, almost two billion north, south, south, north uh, exports in live animals and food, and that's really, really important. And dairy is organised in a limited basis. Yeah. Yeah. And um, the quantum of trade with Britain uh, is often cited particularly by the party opposite. But does he agree with me that the, the highly integrated nature of our supply chains need to be considered in terms of those pro products, particularly in agri-food? Exactly. Well, dairy is a good example. Most of the milk produced in the north is collected by dairy producers, which are ba dairy was based in the south. So just before I conclude, and I'm out of time here now, uh, in terms of legislation, yes, there's a huge amount of bandwidth being taken up by legislation. Within DERA alone, we have 74 pieces of secondary legislation to scrutinise and pass before December, thanks to Brexit. And that's going to put huge pressure on the officials within the department, indeed our own committee in DERA, to have to try and scrutinise and pass this here to, so that DERA has a functioning rulebook come the 31st of December, uh, thanks to Brexit. So in conclusion, I compend the motion and support uh, the call for, um, you know, uh, um, more fa education and training for our businesses and far rural communities, farming communities. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Christopher Stalford. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the chair of the committee referred there in her intervention to Mr. McAleer about our highly integrated supply chain chains. That is precisely why the protocol is a bad idea, because it interrupts our highly integrated supply chains east-west. Um, I think it's important that we put a bit of a political context uh, on the record. The DUP voted against the withdrawal agreement in Parliament, and at that time we set out our clear opposition to any concept of Northern Ireland's economic place in the UK internal market being compromised. The protocol compromises it, therefore we oppose the protocol. The DUP on three occasions... Yes, happy to. Um, there seems to be a degree of confusion because uh, looking at the remarks that the First Minister made on Sky Television, I think on Friday, 
She seemed to be of the opinion that we should be following what the protocol says. Could the honourable member clarify, please? Happy member to. Has an extra minute. Thank you. Happy to. The first minister acknowledged what the present legal reality is. Acknowledging reality does not mean endorsing the same or approving the same, unless, of course, you happen to be reading the commentary in the political uh, editorial of the newsletter. But that's for another issue. Uh, the DUP on the DUP. On three, I'll give away later to Mr. Alistair, always happy to. The DUP on three occasions helped to stop Theresa May's version of the withdrawal agreement. We spoke against it, we argued against it, and we voted against the current Prime Minister's Brexit proposals. We are still arguing that in these negotiations the withdrawal agreement should be scrapped or changed to take account of the need to protect Northern Ireland's place in the internal market of the United Kingdom. Uh, others were very upset by the speculation that was in the Financial Times yesterday. What I would say is that one swallow does not a summer make. And while I hope that the government will move to protect our position through the legislation that's due to be published tomorrow, I will judge the government at London on the action and the content of that legislation rather than briefings to uh, the newspapers. On the 20th of May, the government published a policy paper on its approach to the Northern Ireland Protocol, and this included four principles. One, unfettered access for Northern Ireland's business to the rest of the UK, and particularly the trade should take place as it does presently. Two, no tariffs on internal UK trade. Three, no new customs infrastructure in Northern Ireland, and four, Northern Ireland should benefit from UK trade deals and not be excluded from them. We believe, as a party, that these objectives must be the immovable foundational position and are extremely concerned with the absence of regular updates to Northern Ireland and to businesses to date. I give way to Mr James Alistair QC. Thank you, Mr Stoford. Um, very formal. Um, the member has been telling us that his party is all on the one page about this matter. But I refer back to what Mr. Aiken raised. Last Friday, the First Minister said, I mean, there are some who would continue to fight the protocol. I have to recognize that it is the reality now. And then last night, his party, whether as a rebuke or otherwise, said that they continue to maintain that the protocol must be scrapped. Are those some people who will continue to fight it? And which side is he on? Where I stand on Brexit throughout the Brexit process, I normally in these debates stand shoulder to shoulder with him. It's a pity that he can't stand shoulder to shoulder with me. The First Minister was very clear in what she said. She acknowledged the reality of the situation as in the law that has been passed whilst disagreeing with it. And we all disagree with it, or certainly we all on these benches disagree uh, with the content of the protocol. The party opposite to bring motions and amendments, or to bring motions, the party opposite had an opportunity for years to be participating in the shaping of any Brexit outcomes. But they chose not to. They refused to take their seats at Westminster, where these matters are debated and discussed on an almost weekly basis. Okay, go on. Um, I have to say to the member that the member should reflect on the fact that Sinn Féin in the European Parliament secured 641 MEPs to protect the Good Friday Agreement in all of its parts, no hardening of the border in Ireland and the peace process. We were, we were at the side of the table that mattered. I remember, I recall referring to this, uh, while the lady was a member of the European Parliament, they were referring to it as a charm offensive. I don't know which it was in her case, whether it was the charm or the offensive. But the fact of the matter is that they could have went to Westminster to take their seats and participate in the shaping of a Brexit outcome, but they didn't. And not only that, they criminally kept these institutions down for three years when we could have been having an input into uh, the Brexit process. So we will not take lectures on shaping the best possible outcomes, and I take this opportunity to express my full confidence 
in the economy minister. She's doing a good job, and I'm sure she will continue to. Thank you, sir. Thank you, and I call Liz Kimmins. Uh, Can Corla and I rise to speak in uh, support of the motion and of the subsequent amendment? Um, I think there's been a lot of focus, particularly around the, the trading arrangements, and I, I wanted to home in a wee bit more at a sectoral level um, in terms of financial services and the, the lack of attention that this sector has been given um, within the, the protocol and, and subsequent discussions. Um, I think it is very important to emphasise the very challenging situation that the sector finds themselves in, um, particularly, as, as my colleague mentioned, 16 weeks out from a deadline. Um, the protocol makes no reference to financial services, despite a recent report from the Department for Economy outlining the huge importance of this sector to the economy here in the north, employing 24,000 people and a contribution of $2.4 billion to the economy in the last year alone. The financial services sector is experiencing huge uncertainty around passporting firms in the north, and if this continues, we can see these firms gravitating towards the south as they are likely to no longer view the north as a viable option to do business because of red tape. The loss of passporting uh, with, with no clear replacement system will have a, a serious impact. Already we are seeing businesses putting in place contingency steps to trade on both sides of the border in the absence of any clarification on their future. As a representative for Newry Armagh, Newry has been seen in recent years as developing into a specialist in financial services, with Indigenous firms, including First Derivatives, who, who are a massive employer not only in the constituency but across the north, um, providing in the regions of 2,000 jobs to the local economy. The lack of a clarity being afforded to them is causing significant concern. And on the topic of cross-border operations, Yes. Thank you very much indeed, and thank you very much indeed for highlighting the importance of uh, local companies in Northern Ireland. But there is a significant issue about digital taxation, digital taxation legislation being brought in by the EU. Would you and your party support being part of the digital taxation legislation coming into the EU, or would they rather we had a more bespec, equal and level playing field approach across the rest of the United Kingdom on this issue, bearing in mind the importance to jobs? Member has an additional minute. Thank you. And I thank the member for his contribution. I suppose, in the absence of any uh, clarity going forward, I think it's difficult to, to take a position on that at this stage. Um, but it is something that we need to, to be looking at very seriously, uh, regardless of the outcome. Um, but as I go back to my point there on the topic of cross-border operations, and, and coming from a cross-border or a border constituency where cross-border working is, is, is a huge part of our economy, I think it's also very important to highlight how cross-border uh, workers have been left behind and forgotten about throughout this. Not only does this impact on the lives of individuals who don't know whether they will have a job post uh, 31st of January, but also for employers in the area, and particularly our local employers, as I've referred to previously. Um, because EU citizens are being penalised, and when we should be encouraging people from other countries to contribute their skills to our economy, um, we are treating them particularly badly. Similarly, um, there is, there's been a lack of clarity around the mutual recognition of, uh, recognition of qualifications. Um, we talk about nurses, doctors, all um, standing on the same qualifications across the EU. Where does this stand, as there's been no mention of this? So, um, Going back to the original motion, I think it's very, very important that the economy minister looks at this and, and reaches out to all of those sectors and, and provides detail and clarity, training and education to help them move forward in the short period ahead. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Mark Durgan. Long before the COVID-19 pandemic, warnings about the, the damage that the UK government's plans, or rather lack thereof, for Northern Ireland beyond the 31st of December would cause came loudly and frequently from members of these benches and from the business community. Those warnings were made by cabinet ministers contradicting one another on what paperwork would be required to send goods to Britain and when asked how they might square this circle, vague assurances about the regime that would be implemented. Now we learn that it could well be by reneging on what they agreed. The impact of the pandemic has made the scale of the task even greater, as our SMEs face the double whammy of that economic hit and the end of the transition period. We are now just over three months away from that ending. Time is of the essence. 
The struggle to prepare would have been difficult enough without the crisis facing many of our businesses today simply to survive. The Working Group's comprehensive document lays bare the unanswered questions, and Mr McAleer highlighted a few. Which is why I have joined with my colleagues in signing the amendment, calling for the Executive to set out details of the legislation it needs to introduce and that this Assembly needs to pass to ensure businesses, employees and consumers can go into 2021 with at least the burden of uncertainty on that front lifted. And we, as legislators, need a time frame of and an outline of the passage of that legislation. The Minister should also provide multiple information and training opportunities across Northern Ireland at no cost to businesses. I would also ask the Minister, in her response, to set out what plans she has for ongoing support once the transition period ends. A few lines on ANI Direct just won't cut the mustard, nor will bombarding businesses with copious amounts of guidance that they have to wade through. Businesses need easy access to detailed, practical and, importantly, tailored advice to help them navigate the post-Brexit trade landscape, and they need to know what financial support will there be there to enable them to do so. Stepping back, Akhyunkolia, all of this, of course, takes place against the backdrop of our local economy. We sometimes hear about the pandemic and Brexit offering an opportunity to rethink the economy and the world of work, but in fact, they demand it. Over the summer, we published the SDLP's four principles for a long-term economic recovery that take into account the distinctiveness of our economy in terms of its sectoral, geographical and governance profile. I do fully believe that these are principles every party in this Assembly could and should support. Greater powers for this Assembly and Executive so that we can disperse economic activity more equally and sustainably across the North. We are all well aware of the problems embedded in our economy. We tend to, and certainly I tend to speak about the east-west divide in Northern Ireland, which is particularly pronounced in my constituency of Foyle, but it is in fact, or seems to be, a divide between Belfast and the rest of the North. The concentration of economic activity in Belfast has always been a problem, but it comes under even more strain when faced with the greater demand for flexible working. The old model of expecting workers, young and old, to flood into the one city for the bulk of job opportunities already looks antiquated. We need to address regional imbalance urgently, and the most impactful way of doing so would be by expanding university provision in the North West. The economic benefits of doing so would filter out well beyond the education sector and undoubtedly well beyond the wonderful city of Derry. The deadline to prepare for the end of the transition period is rapidly closing in. Yet the support for businesses to adapt cannot end on the 31st of December, and nor can it take place without a strategy for a wider economic recovery. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Andrew Muir, and I remind the member that he will have three minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. The end of the transition period represents the most significant change to trade in Northern Ireland for a generation. Less than four months ago, Northern Ireland businesses uh, remain largely in the dark as with regards to what technical and operational details which will apply from this date. Instead, all they are getting is political games from the government at Westminster. The timing could not be worse. Thousands of local small and medium-sized businesses have been hit hard from the pandemic and do not have the reserves left to be able to cover the costs that arise from Brexit. The high-stakes game that the UK Government is currently waging in the Brexit negotiations is not one that Northern Irish businesses can afford to play. We need clarity, consensus and support for businesses, recognising, however, that the full and worst effects of Brexit cannot ever be fully mitigated. My party, therefore, supports both the motion and the amendment today. 
Educational and training opportunities to enhance the capacity of local businesses to prepare for post-transition training arrangements, arrangements would be useful, but getting clarity on what these actual arrangements are must be the first priority, not only to let businesses prepare, but also because the legislative time frame between now and the end of December is very short. This Assembly needs as much detail as possible with regards to the legislation to be scrutinised during that period, using an accelerated passage as the exception rather than the norm. There are many areas where technical and operational details are required, uh, but the UK Government's latest reported strategy, as in the Daily Telegraph, to say that the withdrawal agreement never really made sense anyway and to threaten to unilaterally walk away from the agreement is not the way to get the clarity required. The UK Government signed up to this less than 12 months ago, and talk in recent days does not exactly help build faith and trust in the current negotiations. So much for that great oven ready deal sold last year. Only detailed technical and operational guidelines negotiated and agreed with the EU will provide the small and medium sized businesses with the information they need to make plans now. There is a lot of discussion here today around the issue of consent. I would add that the Alliance Party, alongside many other parties, campaigned to remain within the European Union, and the ultimate demonstration of consent was in the vote that took place, where the majority of people in Northern Ireland voted to remain within the European Union. We are now dealing with the consequences of Brexit, and it is important that we do all we can to assist businesses so they get the clarity and the support that they deserve. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. And, uh, I now call on the Economy Minister, Ms. Diane Dodds, and uh, just to remind people we'll have 15 minutes. Yeah. Oh, Apologies, Mr. Speaker. Um, first of all, I want to thank the members uh, for their participation in this very important debate. There is much that we can agree on in the motion. We can all agree that the local economy has both unique and complex characteristics. We are the only part of the United Kingdom with a land border with another jurisdiction. And we all recognise the complex nature of our supply chains across that border. I would hope that we will all also agree that the UK's internal market, the proper functioning of that market, and our full participation in it is absolutely vital to our economic well-being. It is what sustains jobs and family income in Northern Ireland. And as the member for East Antrim uh, has said, is my top priority. Indeed, the benefits of belonging to the United Kingdom have been starkly demonstrated during the COVID-19 crisis, when the support for the local economy from national government has been unprecedented. Nevertheless, it is a challenging time for business. May I also take this opportunity to commend the business community, which has shown such resilience over the last number of months. I have been working closely with business organisations since taking up office, both on COVID response and through my own department's EU Exit Stakeholder Forum. I have consistently said that my top priority is to seek to ensure that Northern Ireland firms have unfettered access to our own internal market in the United Kingdom, and that we do not have any competitive disadvantage within that market. <clears throat> in recent weeks, our government has published a white paper on its vision for the United Kingdom's internal market and has included unfettered access and a trader's support service. I would like to make some progress and then I will give way. Uh, a trader support service within that vision. I continue to engage with Bayes in this matter and in common with the motion, seek to ensure that they are aware of the need for great urgency and clarity uh, on the issues. I also note um, um, the Sinn Féin Agriculture spokesperson's uh, statement that he too wants unfettered trade. I am therefore at a loss to know why he and his party persist in supporting a withdrawal agreement and a protocol that would endanger that trade. Can I also 
reassure the member for South Belfast, who unfortunately clearly didn't want to hear uh, the response to his own debate um, or his amendment since he has left the chamber, that I am both direct and blunt um, with uh, the ministers uh, in London and uh, in my frequent uh, quad calls with other devolved administrations across the United Kingdom. And for his information, and perhaps he will read the Hansard of the debate if he isn't here to hear the debate, um, um, he should actually read um, my uh, published short-term medium. Our, in, a, in a moment, in a moment. Uh, can, no, in a moment. Can I also suggest that he should read the short and medium term plan for economic recovery um, that was published by my department in June, um, setting out our plans for the Northern Ireland economy. I have been consistent since then in my uh, work within the executive and in the bids that I have made um, to the finance minister um, to that uh, published paper. I share the concerns of business and through my stakeholder engagement forum and regular meetings with all aspects of our economy, frequently discuss these issues with business. There is no doubt that absolute clarity on how businesses will be trading on the 1st of January is necessary. The sooner we have this clarity, the sooner businesses can understand the steps they need to take and we as an executive can see where government needs to step in to add support for businesses to adapt. It is also right that internal UK trade should not be subject to any unnecessary administrative or financial burdens. This is the demand of business and their representative organisations. And I would support trusted trader schemes and the binning of exit summary declarations on Northern Ireland to GB trade. Of course, this is a negotiation. And there is an onus on Michel Barnier on behalf of the EU to, as he would say, be flexible and imaginative. I'm almost nostalgic for those meetings in Brussels. So far, if the information coming from the negotiations is correct, there has been a maximalist approach on everything in relation to the protocol, including exit summary declarations and goods at risk. The EU should recognise that this is risking the income of families right across Northern Ireland. However, I also note the recent press speculation that the government will pursue fallback measures under the Internal Market Bill to protect Northern Ireland's interests should a deal not be agreed that mitigates the threat of the Northern Ireland Protocol. I did not vote for the withdrawal agreement and the Northern Ireland Protocol. I have been consistent and clear in my former role as an MEP and in this House that the protocol is damaging to trade within the United Kingdom. The responsibility for the protocol lies firmly with the government and those who voted for and continue to advocate its implementation. So while I would want to see the detail of the proposed clauses, I would welcome this approach. The government must continue to remove any disadvantages to the Northern Ireland Protocol brought uh, to Northern Ireland brought by its signing up to the protocol. And indeed, I will be raising these issues directly with the business secretary, Alex Sharma, later today. And in um, ensuring that the UK government not only uh, move to protect Northern Ireland's place within the union, but in do so doing, protect our trade with our largest market. And also put those trading arrangements on a sustainable footing and cover the full spectrum of our economic interests. Again, for the benefit of the member from East Antrim, this is not following London, this is challenging London and making sure that London understands the needs of business and families in Northern Ireland. I also want to take the opportunity to indicate to the House today that as the Minister responsible for issues in relation to international trade, I will be writing to executive colleagues this week to make them aware that at this stage, 
I will not be seeking to bring forward a motion to seek legislative consent in the Northern Ireland Assembly for the Trade Bill, which is currently making its passage through Parliament. It is absolutely essential that Northern Ireland is able to be a full participant in future UK trade deals. So far, the Minister for International Trade has been unable to provide the necessary legislative assurance that this will be the case, and there are still too many uncertainties around the implications for internal UK trade. While there are important provisions within the Bill for the Trade Remedies Authority and the rollover of existing EU deals, there remains uncertainty in these important areas. Of course, I will continue to engage with the Department for International Trade and the trade forum set up between all constituent parts of the United Kingdom on these vital issues. Yes, of course I can. I'm really grateful to the Minister for giving way, and apologies, I just came back into the, to the chamber, um, but I was listening to her remarks, and just on the trade deals point, has she made representations, and if not, will she, um, either through London or directly to Brussels, about the possibility of Northern Ireland benefiting from EU trade deals, continued access to EU trade deals, in the spirit of, as she and her colleagues have talked about, having the best of both worlds in relation to access to both EU and UK markets? Is that something she'll take forward? I know that this is a subject that the member has uh, advocated for some particular time, but this will be a matter for the negotiation. For my part, Northern Ireland's place is within the United Kingdom. Northern Ireland needs to be able to benefit fully from UK trade deals and not just be a named participant in those UK trade deals. That is vitally important for Northern Ireland businesses, for Northern Ireland families, jobs and prosperity here in Northern Ireland. However, the greatest help to business will be when the government provides clarity. There are an important range of interventions in the meantime and services to local businesses that are being provided at local council level and by many of the business organisations themselves. InvestNI offers a range of support services to companies which includes a Brexit preparation grant, information workshops, an online assessment tool, and online tutorials which provide access to specialist advisors in customs, tariff, taxation, strategic sourcing, people movement and immigration. If you just let me finish this point, I absolutely will. I welcome the various online webinars scheduled for September and October on key aspects of the post-transition environment, including the EU settlement scheme and preparing for the post-immigration system, VAT implications and data transfer issues. We should not underestimate the scale of this work, nor the issues still to be resolved to enable businesses to understand their areas of biggest exposure and what to do next. For giving way, um, as I'm sure you, you, you realise, my colleague and friend, uh, as he's already stated, and sitting outside in the lobby, we're moving in and out. We're only allowed four members in at a time because of the COVID restrictions. There's no doubt I'm sure he would have been glad, like the rest of us, to be able to sit in here and listen to all of what you had to say. Thank you, Mr Speaker. But, Minister, when you were a member of the European Parliament, you had your office in Lisburn, my own constituency, and not far from where your office was is one of the biggest employers in Lagan Valley, and that's Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola makes its syrup in Ballina in County Mayo in the west of Ireland, brings it up into the north of Ireland for packaging and distribution, then round the whole island of Ireland. Also, uh, whisky, uh, which is a growing industry, Mr Speaker, here now, and uh, all of that malt whisky is made in County Antrim. Can you tell me how these, how these are going to operate, how these businesses are going to find crossing the border numerous of times, not to mention so many more that we do have, because to me it's impossible. Um, can I thank the member for his intervention? I understand, of course, the COVID regulations, but I am also insistent uh, that those who challenge the minister should be here to actually listen to the minister's response on these issues. Can I say also, in relation to um, my office in Lisburn, um, I had a, 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 a wonderful experience in my office in Lisburn. I visited Coca-Cola many times during that time. Uh, and of course, the protocol facilitates um, cross-border trade. Um, and in my speech at the start, I acknowledged those complex chains 
uh, of uh, supply chains and manufacturing chains that we have within our economy in Northern Ireland. I'm also, if I can just continue on, on the issues uh, that are there to help business, I'm also supportive of Intertrade Ireland in helping businesses to continue to trade cross-border and to encourage businesses to make their first steps into export trade across that border. Intertrade Ireland's Brexit Advisory Service provides financial support and professional support on customs, supply chains, rules of origins, with online learning supplemented by specialist webinars um, at uh, cross-border market. Intertrade um, Ireland are also exploring the development of a cross-border trade information centre and a new supply ch chain programme. Both initiatives will help firms across the island to benefit from the growth that cross-border trade brings. As we have seen through this debate and my earlier comments, full clarity on trading arrangements for January the 1st is not here. But businesses can take action to understand how the issues play and how they could impact on their trading model. And I would encourage them to go to the Invest NI and Intertrade Ireland web pages, utilise the online Brexit tool, enrol for the webinars, and if appropriate, apply for the support vouchers. We have today talked about um, very important interventions for businesses, but I also believe that the success for business um, will also depend on a holistic approach to a very wide-ranging set of issues that the economy uh, faces here uh, in Northern Ireland. We need to see the timetable for legislating for unfettered access to trade between Northern Ireland and GB. I hope the Internal Market Bill will provide that. I hope that... Um, yes, I will. The Minister's I time is I almost forgot. up. I thank the Minister for giving way, but would the Minister agree with me that given the UK Government aims, it is simply impossible to satisfy both the Internal Market Bill proposals and the NI Protocol unless the UK remains aligned with the EU Internal Market Regulations for Goods? The Minister's time is almost up. It's thank you up. for your indulgence, Mr Speaker. Um, sorry, um, I, had apo I apologise, I had forgotten about the, the intervention. Um, I acknowledge that there are difficulties. What we, I need, and um, I'm absolutely insistent, that the government provide us the clarity that they say that they will give us around the unfettered access for Northern Ireland goods in the UK market. Can I say to the Minister, the time is up. Sorry Thank you. That. That actually brings me to remind members that the courtesy of a member to take an intervention should not be abused by people making long or lengthy interventions because you've caused a part of difficulty. Okay, I call on uh, Colin McGrath to wind on the amendment. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, um, I rise to um, wind on the amendment that we have made. Um, I suppose maybe just to start. The remarks that we have heard here today, we hear about the east and the west being better or the north and the south. Um, I suppose it indicates one thing for business. Brexit is bad for business. Remain was the only way for us to be truly supportive of business and enable them to be able to carry out all of the trade that they were doing. And I thank uh, members for their contribution here today to this debate. Brexit has been a slow-moving car crash, with Northern Ireland's economy and society at greatest risk. People across my constituency of South Down uh, voted strongly to remain and have backed pro-Remain parties at each election since. They are deeply concerned about the impact of leaving the EU on their businesses, their community and on society. Despite the efforts of the SDLP and others in this chamber and at the executive table, the British government dogmatically refused to extend the transition period and are forcing the North to crash out of the EU in just a few short months. People across this House, across our community, had some hope that when the Assembly returned, they would finally get some clarity. But unfortunately, Mr Speaker, they have been badly let down. People demanded clarity and have been met with denial, obfuscation and outright silence. And it's not good enough. People deserve better. Um, our amendment to this motion seeks clarity around reality. It's about real time skills, time skills that business need to know, 
that uh, they need to consider and which they need to deliver. Businesses need certainty. And my colleague Matthew O'Toole, in proposing the amendment, highlighted how the British government has made many promises about Brexit, many of which business had accepted, accepted that they had interpreted and they were preparing for. But in the last 48 hours, they may be railroaded. A British government that cannot be trusted means that our executive must step up to the mark. And I would like maybe if the Minister, obviously I'm speaking after she has, but maybe to detail for us in other ways how long the Brexit discussions were at the last executive, four months before the cliff edge deadline. I wonder, did it last more than 10 minutes? And Matthew highlighted the irony that the extension to the transition period would have helped prepare especially for trade north-south, but also east and west. It was in everyone's interest, but many in this chamber voted against that extension. They voted against helping businesses, and that means that right now we must do all that we can to help. Mr Aiken discussed many of the very uncertainties about the process with reference, for example, to state aid. You again highlighted the confusion that there is, the uncertainty that we have to face, and we don't even have a timetable for the legislation that we need to pass. And Mr Dixon highlighted the confusion that the press speculation over the potential railroading of the uh, protocol, and then the heavy frustration that's been felt by senior members of the legal team for the British government if they have resigned. Again, confusion, uncertainty, no detail and an agenda from our executive that may not even have lasted 10 minutes. We need detail, we need timing, and we need to know what the processes are going to be. Given the chaos that we have seen this week alone, the continued silence and passivity of the joint leaders of our devolved government is nothing less than inexcusable. The, um, since January, they have largely remained silent on vital pressing issues for the delivery of the protocol to the protection of citizens' rights and the undermining the principles of devolution. I appeal to the Joint First Ministers, do not let Boris Johnson and his cronies recklessly force us out of the EU on December the 31st and leave our businesses and our communities in chaos. This, this place is back after three long years of silence. However, Mr Speaker, there is no point in us being back at work if we are not using this Assembly to speak up for people across our society. I made the mistake the last time. I'm going to get to the end of my remarks. The Joint First Ministers must use this Assembly to explain what actions they are taking to minimise the harm of our, to our economy and to our society. In Wales, and particularly in Scotland, their devolved legislators have robustly stood against Boris Johnson and his reckless agenda. We must do the same, Mr Speaker, or do the First Ministers really think that we should blindly follow the Tories in one act of bad faith after another? Thank you. I thank the member, and I call on, Mart I call on Martina Anderson to wind up the debate on the motion. You have ten minutes. Um, and I want to recognise the fact that all of the parties here are supporting the motion and the amendment. Now, given that you don't get an extra minute if you let people in, people uh, should bear that in mind because I want to, like the Minister did, want to get through uh, my speech here and, my, and all your contributions. I want to acknowledge the work that has been done by uh, Sinn Féin, Dr. Heva Archibald, um, as chair of the uh, Economy Committee and throughout this entire process. And as she clearly stated in this debate, you know, the scale of Brexit difficulties facing SMEs, and she's been saying this for such a long time, that there does need to be training and support. And the added confusion by the provocative and the shameful attempt, as she has said, by the British government, who are once again playing fast and loose with the Good Friday Agreement, the all Ireland economy and the peace process. She outlined a number of measures that uh, you, Minister, need to bring forward, and I didn't really hear much of them, to be honest with you, in your contribution. And she has talked to a number of businesses, and she's very clear what businesses want. Some people listening to you, Minister, today might fear that the department and yourself are maybe snuggling up asleep. Because what we are at at this moment of time 
uh, that we are facing, and we're hearing it from businesses, that we, they need not just clarity, they need support, they need action. And therefore, I fear that one might be behaving like a Brexiteer as opposed to a minister. As SMEs, um, are they to read from the responses that you and the British government are using your own inaction to undermine a legally binding international treaty? And that's crucially important. Um, Sinn Féin's uh, Declan McAleer, who's also chair of the Dairy Committee, he had spoken at length about the 25,000 farm workers and the 60 questions, I think he said, Chair, that he has put to the Minister, and he's still waiting for an answer on that's Minister Putz, by the way, not, not, not yourself. Uh, but um, he's still waiting for an answer. And um, I think that might have been the committee that might have put those, yes. So, so regardless, I have to say, of whether there is a deal or no deal, the British government is obliged to ensure that there are border control posts, checks and controls on goods entering the north of Ireland. And they confirmed they would do, do that only a few weeks' time. Now, the protocol is an ugly compromise. No one said it was perfect, but businesses and farmers will pay the price for, unfortunately, what you on the opposite side have cost them dearly. MLA Liz Kimmins, um, who lives very close to the border partition in Ireland, and she indicated the disaster of Brexit for the thousands of people who cross the border every day to work and to study. And she rightly focused the impact that there will be on the financial services, particularly for her own constituency and others, and the danger that there will be of businesses relocating to places that are going to have access to one of the, lar or the largest market uh, in the world in terms of the EU market with 440 million customers. Um, I think that you know, there, has, um, there has been agreement without doubt that, um, that there should be no diminution of rights, and she pointed out the importance of recognition of uh, qualifications for workers, but she's recognised, despite the statement that there be no diminution of rights, that we have workers' rights, environmental rights, consumer rights, all potentially under threat. Mr Gary Milliton, uh, MLA for my own constituency, he asked members to speak to business. Well, I would respectively suggest, uh, Mr Milliton, that you listen to business particularly businesses in your own community, because if you listen to the Dairy Chamber of Commerce and the report that they have given us all, yourself included, they have told you, like me and others, that they are unprepared, uninformed, and they need help and assistance. So we're hearing them very loud and clear. Mr Gordon Dunn, you don't like the protocol, I understand that, but it is an order. It is, a is it an order for a member when speaking to refer directly to other members as you and your, surely all remarks should be directed through the chair. Do you demand members uh, that people should speak through the chair? Okay, I will speak through the chair, not a problem. Um, so, Mr. Gordon uh, Dunn, he doesn't like the protocol, and um, he said, it's, we, as we have all said, it is an ugly compromise. But the DUP statement last night, and I, and I think when I'm listening to Mr. Stalfin reporting and Salford reporting, and in terms of, you know, he talks about he's very confident in his own minister. Of course, you would say that anyway. Of course, you would be. And uh, you've always rejected the, the protocol. That is what the, minister, the member has said. But the DUP statement last night boasted that the DUP had stopped Theresa May's version of the withdrawal agreement. Well, well done, the DUP. Um, you know, what they ended up with was, from their point of view, was something much worse than what they wanted. So the, the, the DUP, I believe, and Brexiteers um, want to keep the North um, in terms of, you know, in Britain's internal market, and we all know the importance of unfettered access into markets for businesses, and that's, that's something that many agree with. But it, they will do that if it means a harder border in Ireland. They will do that if it means reinforcing partition. They will do that if it means um, discarding the Good Friday Agreement in all of its parts. And they will think that that is job well done. Boris Johnson once said, over my 
dead body will there be a border in the Irish Sea? Well, I think he was alive and kicking uh, when he did just that. And he signed up to a border down the Irish Sea. So that was the changes that the DUP made to Theresa May's um, protocol. Only 24 hours before we had the British government's latest British, uh, Britain's fiasco about Brexit unfolding, we've heard from the leader of uh, the DUP, Arneen Foster, who for some businesses thought they were getting some reassurance that she had reached the point of realisation that there would be a trade border in the Irish Sea. A regulatory border and a custom border is a long way from Nigel Dodds insisting that the integrity of the UK was more important than Brexit. Well, I have to say that listening to what's happened over the last couple of days, the DUP seem to be all over the place. To the SDLP, I want to say uh, thank you for your amendment. Yes, we acknowledge that amendment and um, it adds to the motion that was brought forward. And as has been saying, all of the pro-Remain parties um, are all on the one page and they've already contacted the British government and Boris Johnson in relation to the latest uh, fiasco. And Mr Matthew Till is right, Till is right when we, don't, uh, we do need to cushion um, the impact for workers and for businesses. And I don't think that the SDLP should be surprised. I don't think the pro remain party should be surprised, given that they are the majority in the executive when they find out that the rest of the executive doesn't agree with us and we can't get a shared position. You know, do the maths. Of course, we're the majority in there with that view, but the Brexiteers aren't going to agree with this, and that's not news uh, to you. I think Mark Durkin, you know, he said the warning signs have been heard, or, well, I think they've been made. I don't know if they have been heard. And obviously he said about people need to listen to him, and he's absolutely right about the devastation that Brexit is going to cause to his own constituency, my constituency in Derry. Colin McGrath, you know, talked about needing more information, about confusion and uncertainty. But some people might think, and I have to say that some people might think that the STLP's high horse is not a safe place really for them to rest on because 23 of the common frameworks, the Brexit common frameworks to be sorted before the end of this year resides where? with their minister, Nicola Mallon. Now, I did ask for the kind of clarity that the members had talked about, uh, Colin McGrath talked about, from your minister, about transport, about rail passengers, about the rights, and about EU's driving hours, all of which have to be worked through before the end of this year, but she wasn't able to, to enlighten me one iota. I want to acknowledge what uh, Stuart Dixon had said, particularly his exasperation. I share them in terms, and he's, he accused the, uh, the minister of slavishly following London, which I think that's something that a lot of people would concur with. And Andrew Moore, who had talked about and reminded people that the majority of people here in the North voted to remain within the, the EU. Uh, also, um, Steve Aikens uh, had already made an intervention with himself in relation to, uh, to state aid, and you know he will not be surprised to learn that Sinn Féin has been very clear about Apple and tax uh, and all that had happened in, in the South. So when we're talking about harmonisation across the island, once we get to that point, that will be a different place and a different country for everyone. Constitutional status, you mentioned, in the Good Friday Agreement in terms of the principle of consent, that refers to actually the constitutional question. So I think if we're all so concerned as we are in different aspects about this, about the constitutional question, then I think let the people decide what union do we want to be a part of. Do we want to Remember stay in the up. union with Britain or do we want to reunite Ireland? And I think that's the constitutional Remember question and that will answer the principle of consent question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all members. The question is that the amendment standing in the names of Matthew O'Toole, Colin McGrath, Mark Durgan and Cara Hunter be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The question is that the motion as amended be agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Would uh, members take a raise for a few moments just to be changed the table? Thank you. Now.